was 2.40 p.m. on Friday, March 11th, and Futoshi Toba, the new mayor of Rikuzen Takata, was on the phone with his wife. He had been working here in the city hall non-stop since being sworn in a month before. He wanted to cut out early and take her and their two young sons out to dinner. His wife was here at their home, just 10 minutes away. She said she would email him soon to confirm. Six minutes later, the first tremors of a magnitude 9 earthquake rocked the town and knocked out phones and electricity. Soon after, a massive tsunami smashed to shore and poured into the city. The mayor's two boys, Taiga and Kanato, now 12 and 10, were safe at a school up in the hills. His wife, Kumi Toba, did not survive. Inside the coin laundry laundromat, the dryer is still loaded with clothes. A few steps away, the doors to a clothing store are open and a flyer on the door announces a five-day clearance sale. In the center of town, a giant sign proclaims, understanding nuclear power correctly will lead to an abundant life. Much seems undisturbed in Futaba, where part of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear complex is located. But one element is largely missing, people. Toshimi Fukazawa is worried about his cattle. His farm in Shirakawa is 45 miles southwest of the Fukushima Daiichi power plant, the site of Japan's biggest nuclear disaster. News of radiation-tainted meat from the region has spread fear about the safety of beef from cows like these. Contaminated feed is largely to blame. This is so shocking that I'm speechless. All I can do now is just wait and see how things turn out. The situation is far beyond what a single farm can try to handle. For six months, the gutted remains of the hospital here in Rikuzen Takata have stood empty. Wind blowing through the tsunami smashed rooms where the city's sick once sought care. On March 11th, a wave of black water shattered the windows of the fourth floor inpatient ward. The tsunami swept away nearly a tenth of the people who lived in Rikuzen Takata. The downtown was obliterated. Of all the losses, the destruction of the city's only general hospital has been one of the hardest to bear. Without the hospital, the town will not develop. Dr. Ishiki is fighting hard to build a new medical center here, but it's unclear how much support he will get from cash-strapped provincial and national authorities. For now, he and his staff are treating some residents in an outpatient clinic set up in a prefab building. The makeshift clinic is now seeing 200 people a day. Dr. Ishiki is lobbying the prefecture's hospital management authority for permission to add an inpatient ward. Without one, he says, flu and pneumonia could lead to unnecessary deaths when winter comes. <laughs> なんかそれを着せなければ外に出られないとか、外で遊ばせることができない。食べ物に関してもやっぱり自分の畑で採った野菜はやっぱりどのくらい放射性物質が含まれているかもわからない。できれば子供を思いっきり外で遊ばせる
Kimura has a cheerleader urging him forward, his 81-year-old mother. Immediately following the tsunami, Takako Kimura was interviewed on national television. Her very first words, I can't wait to make delicious sweets here again. Of course, back then everyone was still searching for family members. After the interview, I thought, why was I talking about making sweets? Masayuki Kimura is marking out the site where he plans to erect his temporary store in December. Back in the kitchen again, his family is reviving their recipes. They work out of a donated space, a cargo train car retrofitted with sinks, glass doors, and discounted equipment from nearby towns. Fresh from the oven, ganzuki, a sweet steamed bread. There were approximately 70,000 trees and all of them except this one tree were wiped out in the March 11th tsunami. Since then, we've called this the miraculous lone pine. Hungry for hope, each week, retired teacher Yasumori Matsuzaka visits Riku Takata's 100-foot giant. It's become a symbol of Japan's determination, a symbol that's graced everything, from buttons to keychains, and even ads for local businesses working to rebuild. But nine months since the disaster, this emblem of life is failing.